personal favorite times of year. I love the season. It's so much fun, especially when you have five kids. I was telling my mother-in-law earlier in, in the kitchen, my mother-in-law and father-in-law and uh, nephew are up from California visiting us for Christmas. And I was telling her, I said, Mom, I said, what, what were we thinking? Like, I mean, come on, why did you try to talk some sense into us? What were you thinking having five kids? Because of the chaos sometimes in my house is just unbelievable. And if you have kids, maybe you can relate a little bit tonight. But Christmas can be an amazing time of year. It can be so much fun. But for many of us, the reality of Christmas isn't so fun. In fact, studies say and show that during the Christmas season that you feel your pain more. Like all the things that are bad in your life get exaggerated during the holidays. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. And I think one of the biggest reasons is that Christmas time is something so special and significant that we tend to remember all the years of Christmas past. I think the other thing is, is as it is approaching the end of the year, we all kind of reflect a little bit on our, our year. And we also reflect a little bit more on our life. And for many of us, that can be a good thing, but for uh, a lot of other of us, it can be a really tough thing. It could be a challenging thing. It could be a painful thing. And uh, for many people who are dealing with the reality of life during the Christmas season, whether you're struggling financially or you're struggling with health issues or maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one, maybe you're struggling in your relationship with your spouse or, or a child, the reality of life sometimes can be overwhelming, and Christmas time can become this great and wonderful thing that we do to kind of ease the pain for the moment of really taking a look at our, our lives and where it's headed. But then when that moment is over, we're faced the reality with what a lot of psychologists call the holiday blues. And the holiday blues can come in after the fact, after you've experienced Christmas and the joy of Christmas and the fun and being with, with family. And for some of us, being with family can be a great thing. For other of us, being with family could be a really challenging thing. As you're faced with seeing um, part of your family members that you don't see all the time and even can bring up um, you know, relationships that have challenged you in the past, and maybe uh, it's with a parent or a spouse or a sibling that you, you've had you know, relational issues with, and now you're faced with them face-to-face, -face, so to speak, and are confronted with trying to be nice and forget about all those things, yet the reality is still there, that there's pain and there's challenges. And those things are very real, and all of that in the midst of this beautiful, wonderful thing that we call Christmas. And we're gathered here tonight to worship Jesus and celebrate his birth and really what I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about is to remind you of the significance of that birth and what that significance of that birth that happened 2,000 years ago, what does that mean to you and me today? And I believe that one of the biggest things that all of us struggle with in our lives is the lack of peace. Even for me, I have to admit, for most of today, it felt like I was the uh, last two days really running here, running there yesterday, trying to uh, finish up my Christmas shopping, trying to wrap those presents, trying to get everything done that I need to get done. And it could be very stressful, very chaotic, very hectic, and it could take away from the real meaning of Christmas and why we're even doing this whole thing we call Christmas. And the reality that Jesus Christ was born, that God literally came from heaven to earth in the form of a baby. And what they called him, one of the names that they called this baby was that he would be, was prophesied that he would be called Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Without Jesus, there is no real peace in our lives. And I want to start out with um, going back to scripture in Luke chapter 2 and looking at how Jesus was born in the situation that he was born into because I think it's um, really interesting the way Jesus was born. You ever wonder why God chose to have his son Jesus come to earth as a baby? You ever wonder that? Maybe I'm the only weird one that kind of ponders stuff like this. But you ever wonder, why did he come as a baby? Like he didn't even do anything. Like the Bible is very silent about what happened between when he was a baby after he was born and to when he started his earthly ministry at around age 30. We're left with this big gap. So I'm like, why couldn't you just like send him at 30? Like, why did he have to be come and born as a baby? Like, you know, the way I picture it is 
God could have decided to send Jesus. I, I see him like coming, you know, like riding in on a cloud with thunder and lightning and these big, long, wavy locks. He's looking like Thor with a big hammer, ready to kick some butt and take names and establish his kingdom on earth. I mean, that's what God could have done. I mean, he could have like, he could have surfed in on a rainbow. He could have rode in on a rainbow colored unicorn. I mean, there's like so many cool ways that Jesus could have came. He could have came with a triumphant entry and being, even if he was going to be born as a baby, he could have been born in a palace. Like why, why did God choose? Like, do you think God, you ever wonder this one? You ever wonder why, why God didn't know like all the inns would be full that night? Why did he pick that night? It's like, come on, dude. Didn't you know that they were all going to be full? And, and why, why couldn't he be born in one of those inns instead of in a stable? And, and you know, we kind of glamorize the picture of the birth of Jesus and this, this beautiful barn and all this, you know, stuff. And there, the reality was he was probably born in a cave. Most stables weren't, weren't made of barn wood and all the you know, vintage white stuff we like and we think is really cool. He was actually probably born in a cave and he was born with a lot of stinky animals that eat and poop in that cave and it's messy and it's dirty and he was born in a manger. A manger, do you know what a manger is? A manger, yes, he's paying attention. Way to go, buddy. A manger is where the animals actually fed. It was their feeding trough. The feeding trough for the animals that they slobbered on and bits of food went into, and it was dirty and stinky and messy. This is where the Savior of the world was born, born as a baby, a frail little baby. And yet, let me remind you, this baby was born to a 15-year-old, round 15-year-old teenage girl. Now, let me tell you something. I have a 15-year-old, and she could barely take care of our dog. So why did God choose a 15, 15-year-old teenage girl to take care of the Savior of the world? That makes me a little nervous. But he did. And not only that, he chose to have an immaculate conception. So imagine being the parents of, of little Mary, pregnant, uh, pregnant out of wedlock, mind you, and her, her soon-to-be husband, Joseph. Imagine her parents trying to explain why Mary is pregnant and how she got pregnant to all their friends. Oh, oh yeah, that was God. God impregnated her, really. No, I promise. Oh, yes, sure, sure he did. Right, could you imagine the craziness and the things that probably went through people's mind? But this is exactly the way that God chose in the middle of all that mess and everything from the outside that, that just doesn't even look like surely this could be the king of the world that was born. The prince of peace was born into this. And I've asked God and questioned, why? Why would you have it? I think, I think this is what I've wrestled with and the conclusion that I've come to. That God was born in imperfection. He was born in the most obscure town in all of Israel. Like, people didn't even know, like, is, is there anything good that comes? I mean, all, all this stuff. He was born in a dirty, stinky manger. He was born as a frail little baby that needed to be taken care of by humans. God needing to be taken care of by humans. The frailty. He was born into imperfection to show us that God isn't afraid of our imperfection. God isn't afraid of our weakness. He's not afraid of our failures. He's not afraid to be born into a mess. And yet we think we need to clean ourselves up, that we need to be perfect, that we need to present ourselves to God so that the one and only perfect Savior of the world can come into a clean, perfect house. But that's not the reality that you and I live in, is it? The reality that most of us live in is we live in a state of conflict, in chaos. Paul, I think the Apostle Paul, by the way, one of the, the greatest apostles and followers of Jesus ever in the Bible, Paul, the great Apostle Paul said this. He said, the things that I wanna do, I don't do. And the things that I do do, I don't wanna do. He says, woe is me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of death? Even Paul understood the conflict that most of us live with day in, day out. Even for those of us who are here tonight and we call ourselves followers of Jesus, if we look at our lives and the reality of, of, of what that looks like, it's anything but perfect. It's messy, it's sloppy, it's imperfect. And yet, 
we love God. And Jesus says that I'm not afraid of your imperfection. I'm not afraid of the mess. And this is the chaos and the mess that Jesus was born into when we read in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 6. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. We're going to put it up for you. You could follow along on the screen right up there. And I'm going to start in verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, nearby, watching over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. They thought they saw a ghost or something. We'll get to that in a minute. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company, the heavenly hosts, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying this. Glory to God in the highest, just like we just sang. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Peace to those whom his favor rests. And see, herein lies the problem. For many of us, we look at our lives and we say, how can God's peace rest upon me? Does he find favor with me? Like, does God like me? Does he approve of me? Well, like, where is God in my life? And, and for, for many of us, we feel like God is some distant God, that he's somewhere, and I don't know, he's floating up on a cloud with some fat cherub angels playing on some harps and stuff like that. And, and he's far from, far removed from my life and understanding the complexities of my life, the mess of my life, the imperfection of my life. And God wanted to send his son Jesus. And we're gonna look at some of the names that was given to Jesus. And one of the names, one of my favorite names, is the name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, it means God with us. God with us. See, God came to earth and was born into this human flesh. And he took on flesh, the Bible says. And he humbled himself, taking on the form of a man. Why in the world would God become a baby? So that he could understand the challenges, and he can relate to you. The Bible says that he experienced every temptation that you and I experience in the life. Yes, yet he did not sin. That means that he understands everything that you and I go through in this life. He understands the challenges. He understands all the things that we're faced with. And yet, in the middle of all that, he gives us this promise. Now look at, um, in Isaiah chapter 9. Verse six, it says this. This was way before Jesus was born. This, there was many prophecies about Jesus, but I love this one in particular because it tells us something about the nature of the baby and the person of Jesus that was being born. He says, for to us a child is born. And for many of us tonight, we have an opportunity to let Jesus birth something new in us tonight. That we can not only know Jesus by what the Bible calls being born again, but we can have this thing called peace birthed in us instead of looking for peace on the outside of us. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now, now what that verse always messed me up a little bit. I don't understand that, God. Like, the government will be on his shoulders? Like, the government of Israel will be on his shoulders? Like, what government? The United States government will be on his shoulders? And what that means is that the rule and reign is on his shoulders. Like he came to take on all the things that you and I try to put on our shoulders. And this is where we get in trouble in this life. When we start to put the things that God never meant for us to put on our shoulders, we carry weight that God never told us to carry. In other words, when we put our hope and trust in Jesus, we don't have to carry the weight of our future on our shoulders. We don't have to try to figure out how we're going to do life. We don't have to try to figure out how we're going to make our next paycheck. We don't have to try to figure out these things. When we put our hope and our trust in Jesus, we take it off our shoulders and we put it on him. And his shoulders can carry a lot. And then he goes on to say this, and he will be called 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, prince of peace, prince of peace. He is the Lord of peace. He is the originator of peace. There is no peace without this person called Jesus. Yet all of us sitting here tonight, we long for this thing called peace. We'll do anything for this thing called peace, but yet it's not something that you can buy. It's not something that you can manufacture. As much as we want to, it's not a gift that we could wrap up and put it in uh, under a tree and give to somebody else. This gift only comes from the Prince of Peace. Only comes from the Prince of Peace. Tonight, I want to I want to recap. Over the last three weeks, we've been going through a message series here at Hope Church called "The Ghosts of Christmas," and I love this message series because, first of all, I really love the play or, or the the book by Charles Dickens, "A Christmas Carol." And uh, many of you who haven't read the book. You're like me, you've watched the movie or different variations of the movie. And I love the movie and is characterized by the main character called Ebenezer Scrooge. And this is a grouchy, grumpy, stingy old man who uh, owns his own business, is filthy rich, but nobody cares about him because he doesn't care about anybody else. And he just lived his life how he wanted to, making as much money as possible, buying into the lie that money brings happiness. And yet, here he is, at the twilight of his life, and he has nobody to share his wealth with, and his wealth obviously isn't making him happy. And I love, there, there's a scene um, where the ghost of Christmas yet to come approaches him to show him what's going to happen. He's already, it, it's about midnight, and just on Christmas Eve, just like it is tonight, and these three ghosts show up, the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And we think ghosts come to frighten us. The reality is, is these ghosts of Christmas didn't come to frighten Ebenezer Scrooge. They came to give him a shadow or glimpse of what his life has looked like, what his life looks like now, and what the future of his life will look like if he doesn't change. I think the greatest gift that you and I can have is to have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, come tonight and challenge us to look at our past, to look at our present condition, and to look into our future, and to ask ourselves the question tonight, where are we headed? Where are we headed? And do I have true peace in my heart? Because the greatest gift that you and I can receive this Christmas is the gift of peace. It's the present of peace, and the present of peace only comes from the presence of Jesus Christ. So Father, we just pray right now that you would speak to us, God. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would put away everything, every detail, thought about Christmas, all the things we're gonna do tonight after service, all the things we're gonna do tomorrow, and we just say, come into our heart. Speak to us tonight. Bring your peace in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. When we look at our past, there's three things that we normally do. There's things in our past that, number one, none of us had control over. Like, you never chose the family that you were born into. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your siblings. And some of you are giving your siblings or your parents an elbow. That's right. And uh, there was things that happened to you. Some of them good. Some of them tragic. Some of them things that you would never even want to speak about or remember, they're that bad. Things that you had absolutely no control over. And then there are other things in our life that all of us have control over. Those are the choices that we make out of our own free will. And sometimes that works out, and a lot of times that doesn't work out so good. There's choices that we make that affect who we become. There's a reason that Ebenezer Scrooge was a grumpy, stingy, greedy old man. And when you go back, and when the, when the ghost of Christmas past took him back to his past, we get a glimpse into why he became the person that he is. When he was a kid in school, none of his friends or buddies would include him in different things, and he developed a complex. He, he became isolated, and then he developed a love for money, being in business, and, and bought into the lie that the more money you had, the more happy that you would be. 
And for many of us, we're sitting here today, and, and you may like yourself, you may like where your life is headed, you may be satisfied where you are, but many of us, for many of us, we're not happy when we, when we think about our life. We're not happy with the person that we become, and we're not happy with the person that we're becoming. And yet, in the presence of God, he can change us in a moment by surrendering our life to him. And we have to look at three things that we do as, I think, a reaction to not wanting to deal with our past. And yet God is challenging us that if we never deal with our past, we'll never truly be able to live in the present and in his presence. And for many of us, we are hindered, we are held back by those things in the past. Like, in other words, there's things in our past that haunt all of us. And God wants us to deal with those things. There's three things that we usually do. Number one is we blame other people. We can become and have a victim mentality. Like, it's not my fault, it's this person's fault or that person's fault. And this, this one goes back as early as creation. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God asked Adam, why did you eat of the apple? And I, and I love it. It's one of my favorite. Adam acted like a true husband and protector of his wife. He said, the woman that you gave me made me do it. And so Adam put the blame on Eve. And then when God approached Eve, Eve said, it was that serpent. It was the snake that you made that made me do it. And so she tried to push off the blame. And ever since then, Mankind has tried to push off the blame and responsibility from our own actions. And you see this very prevalent in our culture today. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. And if we're not careful, we could take on a victim mentality. And God says, no, I just want you to deal with this. Just take responsibility and ownership for it. And guess what? It's okay. Because you have to understand something tonight that as big as your biggest sin is, God's grace is bigger. As big as your biggest sin is, God's grace is bigger. The second thing that we do is this. We bury it. We push it down. We repress it. We try to just forget about it. Leave the past in the past. And we think that time heals all wounds. And the reality is that may work with your, a physical wound, but it doesn't work with a wound to your soul. Time does not heal all wounds. That is a myth, and it's not true. Dealing with it and letting God deal with it in you will bring healing into your life, but we can't bury it. We can't try to forget it. We can't try to push it down. For a lot of us, we try to self-medicate it. Like, we, we, the, the pain of realizing our past is too great. So in order to be happy, we chug some beer, we, we, we take some shots, we shoot up, we look at porn, we do whatever to try to self-medicate and forget about our past and the problems that we have. And for many of us, that's the reality of, of what we're dealing with. The last thing that we can do is we can beat ourselves up. And, and I'm really good at this one. And for some of us, this is a real problem. We can look in the mirror and we can, we can say, I hate you. Like, look at you. I can't believe, how can you even call yourself a Christian? Look at you, you are ugly. Look, at, I can't believe that you did that. And there's these little voices in our head that want to remind us of all the mistakes we've made and the failures that we've made. And if we're not careful, we could start to internalize those failures. Let me tell you something tonight. Failure is not a person. It's an event. And it can be rectified. Those three things we need to deal with. And God wants to have us bring peace into our past so we can settle our yesterdays so that we can live in the present. And the other thing is looking at our future. When the ghost of, of Christmas yet to come, he showed Ebenezer what his life would look like if he didn't change. And it was ugly. For many of us tonight, when we look at the current path of our life, we're surrounded by the reality of life, our circumstances. When we look at our future, we, we tend to have two things creep in, anxiety and fear. Anxiety and fear. And anxiety and fear, they work together, but they're just a little bit different. Anxiety is the what ifs. Anxiety is defined by nervousness and fear of what might happen. Like, it's not for certain that's gonna happen, it's just what might happen. So it's all the things that go through our mind, the what ifs. What if I lose my job? What if my marriage doesn't work out? What, what, if, what if, I don't know that I have what it takes to do it. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? 
and it can create all this anxiousness, and I can relate to that. There was years where I struggled with anxiety. I used to have panic attacks where I would just be gripped with sudden fear. My heart would start racing. I'd start sweating. Sometimes I feel like I'm having a heart attack and I couldn't breathe because I didn't have a clear picture of what my future looked like. It was so uncertain. It scared me to death. And tonight, you could leave this place knowing who has your future and who holds your future in your hands if you will just surrender the plan of your life over to him. There's three things that when you surrender your life to God and stop trying to do things your own way and what you think's worst and what w- works and what you think is the best plan for your life, and when you surrender your life and say, God, I've tried to do life on my own terms, I've made my own decisions, and, and it hasn't worked out, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you um, what, what's in my hand, I'm going to put it in your hand. And there's three things that happen when we put our future and we place our trust in the hands of Jesus. The first thing is, he provides for us. He's our provision. Like in the Bible, when, when you know, we, we think all we have is all we have. And when it's all on you and it's all on your shoulders, the best that you can do is, is the best that you can do and it's all on you. But when you put it in the hands of God, the best that you can do and all you have is not all you have anymore because when you take a couple of loaves and a couple of fish and you put it in the hands of Jesus, he can multiply it and he can do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine when you put it in his hands. He provides. The other thing that he does is he gives you purpose. So many people are missing purpose in their life and you might be here tonight and you may be wondering, I don't know what this life is really all about. I feel like I'm wandering around, going in circles. I have no purpose. God, when we give over and surrender our life to him, God will give you a purpose. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, it says that he will take all things in your life, all things, and he'll work them for good for those who love him and are called according to his name. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly. God will take even your bad mistakes, your bad choices, and if you put it in his hands, in his hands, he can make all those things work together for good, for your good. It doesn't say that God causes all things to happen, and it doesn't say that he makes bad things happen. God doesn't cause cancer. God doesn't take people's lives. God God is not the author of those things, but he will take the bad and the ugly, and he will work them for our good. And that leads us to this moment right here, right now, the present, the present. And God can take your past and he can heal you of all those wounds and all the things that you've been running from and pushing away and self-medicating, and he could take away your anxiety and fear about your future right here, right now in this place because the Prince of Peace comes with his presence. There's a scripture, I believe it's John 14, if you guys could put that up. Jesus, before he went to heaven, he lived his earthly life. He knew that his time was come. Do you understand tonight that the reason we celebrate the birth of Jesus is because of the death of Jesus? Like he came on a mission to earth and it wasn't so that we could have Christmas to just celebrate his birth. The reason we celebrate his birth is because of his death and his resurrection because it showed us why he came. Because God so loved you. God so loved you that he couldn't stand to have this gap between you and him anymore. So the first thing tonight that you can experience is you can experience peace with God. Peace with God. That's a peace that only comes from a relationship with God. It's that peace that his favor rests upon you. But Pastor Lance, how do I get that favor? Like, what is that favor? It's right standing with God. It's being justified with God. Because Jesus came and he died on the cross. He died on the cross for your sin and my sin. And because he gave his life as a sacrifice. The Bible says you don't have to do anything except you have to believe that Jesus came and he died for you. And it's in your believing that you're justified through faith. And now you can have peace with God because you've been justified by faith. That means God doesn't want you to try to clean up your act. 
He doesn't want you to try to be better for him so that he'll love you better. God loves you just as much now as he ever will, just as much as when he sent his son as a sacrifice for you. All he's asking you to do, he's not asking you to do something. He's asking you to believe something. And tonight, you can have an opportunity to just believe in your heart that Jesus died for you. And because of that, you can have the peace with God. It's the peace that comes from a relationship. The second thing that happens when you receive the peace of God in your heart, when you surrender your life to him and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, now you can receive peace from God. And look at what Jesus said as he was leaving. He said, he made a promise. He says, I'm gonna go to the Father, but I'm gonna send you another the Holy Spirit, who could come into your heart and into your life. And this is the part that many of us are missing. If you've never surrendered your, your life to Jesus and asked him to come into your life, and the Holy Spirit comes in and he does exactly what Jesus promised, he says this, peace I leave with you, my peace, my peace I give you. The same peace that Jesus had is available to you and me tonight. How? I do not give it to you as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now we think becoming a Christian sometimes is gonna solve all our problems in life. The reality is, is Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Like you're gonna go through some stuff. If you read the Bible, it's a, lot, it's a lot of stories about a lot of people going through some stuff, yet in the middle of it, God was with them. One of the names for Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God's presence and his peace can be with you no matter what you're going through. It's why David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because you are with me. You're with me. God can be with you always in your heart and in your life. I love the New Living Translation version. It says this, I am leaving you with a gift, a gift, a gift. This is a gift that could only come from the Prince of Peace, the author of peace. This Christmas, the greatest gift that you could ever receive is the gift of peace. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Is there anybody here tonight that could use peace of mind and peace of heart? And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. In other words, what is Jesus saying? He's saying this. He says, for many of us, we've been trying to find peace in all the wrong places. We've been trying to find peace as an external source, like somehow, like somehow if our circumstances and our problems align the right way, then we'll have peace. And, and sometimes, in, in just a little glimpse of a moment, every once in a while, we'll get a little taste of all of our circumstances and all our problems being put away and everything just being just right and just perfect. And in that moment, we experience this peace only to have it go away just like that because something else just comes in and messes with it. And it's frustrating and it's hard. And Jesus is saying, you've been trying to find peace at it externally, out of all these things in the world by having the right job, by looking the right way, by having enough money, by, by, by having the right relationships. And some of you tonight, I feel like I'm speaking to somebody, you've been unsatisfied in your marital relationship and you've been thinking about leaving your spouse and God here tonight is saying that no, you don't need to leave your spouse. The problem isn't with your spouse. The problem is in your heart. And when I come in, I can do anything because with me, anything's possible. With man, you can't do it. And you've been trying to do it on your own and too many of us are trying to do life on our own and we just need to surrender to God. So tonight I wanna ask you if you would just close your eyes and bow your head. I wanna pray for you as we begin to close. I believe there's many of you in here tonight that you've never surrendered your life fully to Jesus. This peace that he's talking about, you don't know of. In fact, the opposite in your life, you, you've had turmoil, you have chaos, you, you don't like yourself, you don't like the way your life's going, and you came here tonight, and Jesus is reminding you the reason he was born. He was born in chaos. He was born in a mess. He was born in imperfection. And he could come into your mess. He could come into your imperfection. And he could change your life tonight. Be the greatest gift you ever receive. And I want to ask you if you're here tonight and that's you. I just want to pray for you. 
I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to come to the front or anything like that. But I think sometimes we need to respond to God. And so I just wanna ask if that's you tonight and you wanna surrender your life to Jesus for the very first time, if you would just slip your hand up, nobody's looking. I just wanna pray for you. Just slip your hand up to show as a sign to God that God, I'm gonna surrender my life to you tonight. I want you to come into my heart and my life and I want you to give me a hope in a future. Maybe you're not ready to do that. Maybe you're here tonight and you're like, whoa, that's like a way too big of a step. And maybe so. And maybe Jesus is just asking you, okay, maybe you're not ready to make that decision, but maybe you can just draw a little bit closer to me. Just take one step closer to me. God promises if you draw close to him, that he'll draw close to you. We're gonna sing this song, and this song is about the Prince of Peace. It's about what happens when peace comes into your heart. And as we're singing the song, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit will prompt you to just surrender. And all you have to do is say this prayer. You could say it at your seat. You could say it to yourself. You could say it when you get home tonight. But all you have to do is say, Jesus, I believe that you were born to come and to give your life, to die for me so that my sins could be forgiven. I'm a sinner. Would you come into my heart? I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Change my life from here on out forever. I give you my life. I ask in exchange that you would give me a future and give me a hope and that you would fill me with your peace. And if you will pray that prayer, I promise you God will come into your life and he will do amazing things. And it begins right here, right now in the present. My heart is stone, clouds raging deep within.